a very good afternoon or evening depending on what time I get this published. It is the 4th of November and welcome to the third winter 2023-24 update here on marthoganweather.com. I hope everybody is well, safe, enjoying their weekend so far. It is cloudy and, well in fact it's actually foggy here, not cloudy. Temperature stuck at uh, just over 5 Celsius here at the house. So feeling rather uh, autumnal, uh, if not slightly wintry, actually, this afternoon here. Um, it has been a, a manic past few weeks. I haven't had a single day off in terms of the channel. I've been, uh, of course, working night shift Monday to Friday. And I've also been trying to plan a holiday to Japan. My wife and I um, actually head down to Glasgow tomorrow and then we fly out uh, via Heathrow to Tokyo on Monday. So it is going to be a bit of a disruption to the channel in the next week or so, folks. So still uh, bear with me. Um, I do greatly appreciate the fact that I'm sure you understand that I think it's time for a break. I've not had a week off since May. So it's been pretty busy. So obviously I've thrown together this third update. Let me know in the comments section below what you think about it. Um, I'm going to try and kind of glaze, um, kind of run through the key points as quick as possible to ram this into the 15 minute window that I, I always allow. A lot of people saying, why do you not do a video longer than 15 minutes? I, I it is kind of set with the screencast package that I work with, but also I think that a 15 minute window is suffice because after that 15 minute period is up, sometimes it's easy to start drifting off and, and finding the video too long. So I've, I've got this kind of thing where, rightly or wrongly, um, I've got this thing where I like to try and do it within a 15 minute period because it keeps it a little bit more interest. And also you try and get home your points as quick as possible as well rather than just kind of waffling on like I'm doing at the moment here. Uh, if you find I'm rubbing my eyes, I've just actually slept because I've literally just got up. I've been working on this the, the past few nights. So I hope it makes sense. Um, be sure to check it out on marfogenweather.com. It's freely available for you to read. I'll leave a link in the description below. And you can have a read at your leisure here. So let's have a couple of let's have a quick glance through the main points here. Of course, the current global state, ocean and, and land temperature normally here. Of course, we have got very warm waters compared to average, uh, about the highest global net sea surface temperatures since the satellite era began back in 1979. Here, if you look at the sea surface temperatures from the pole, uh, from the equator to the pole you've got a largely warmer than average sea surface. Of course, you've got a few areas that, that are below average here and a couple of key areas to consider. Uh, we are starting to see the continuation of the demise of the negative PDO or Pacific Decade Low Oscillation. You've got this warming now starting to show up in the North Pacific here. You've got uh, it's still a slight, uh, but a decrease nonetheless of those cold water temperatures uh, off the Baja to the south of Hawaii. That very cold um, you know, slice of water from Sumatra towards the central Indian Ocean Basin, that's your uh, positive IOD signal, of course. And uh, you also have um, the El Nino, of course, continuing in the, the equatorial Pacific, of course. Uh, the key is going to be, folks, does that warm water stay close to the, Pacific, uh, the um, South American coast, or does it start to drift towards the central portion of the Pacific. That is going to be critical. Uh, if we see the convection, so the Walker circulation, of course, that is often referred to with regards to the El Nino base state. It's all very well having warm sea surface temperature at the surface, but what's the atmosphere seeing with the response between ocean and atmosphere? That's going to be the important factor in all this, the positive IOD on the face of it would support more of a stronger jet stream across, particularly the North Atlantic. It tends to favour positive NAOs, but there's a couple of caveats to what we're seeing with regards to that. This is the this, uh, the temperature here, both land and the ocean anomaly here 
year to date so of course we are running very warm indeed that has to get taken into consideration of course uh, when you factor in you know the overall global state at the moment teleconnections the classic climate drivers that we typically look at and are looking at in this video i question sometimes whether that they're as reliable as they once were based on the overall warm ocean and and planet generally speaking it, i think it's getting harder and harder to get a solid 09 10 or 78 79 style winter now i think we're getting more in the way of uh, you know sun stratospheric warming events that release uh you know cold outbreaks such as the beast from the east back in 2018 of course uh we had of course 2021 where we had uh you know major sun stratospheric warming during the middle portion of of uh, i think it was late uh, january early february then we had the coldest since 1995 in the uk especially across the north here you can have a uh, you know very wet octobers and we'll have a look at that in just a second here but the amo you can see here look at the article and you can see it in better detail and you can go through it in a bit more detail as well but you can see here the amo the atlantic multi-decadal oscillation firmly in positive territory then you can see here we we'll had a period back in the early 1900s and also back in the what the 60s 70s in the early 80s where we had the the last negative uh, amo of course uh, we had, of course, uh, exceptional warmth uh, within the North Atlantic, especially early summer after an area of persistent blocking high pressure. It probably was a significant contributor, at least, to that uh, rapid warming and the marine heat wave that was seen. Uh, tropical activity versus the stormy conditions that we've had in recent times, that has allowed to uh, some cooling across the central Atlantic. Do we see a tripole warmth? a cold then warmth across the north atlantic that's going to be the remainder of the, the, the main question here as we go forward past summer pattern probably uh, a 50 50 with regards to the arctic, arctic oscillation positive and negative uh, during the course of the summer but the nao really stands out here uh, probably the most negative nao summer since 2009 yeah you know uh, what followed of course in 2009 record warm september but it has been a very wet period. And of course, our good friend Joe Bastardi at Weatherbell said years ago that where the heaviest rainfall tries to focus on during the middle and second half of autumn, sometimes that is where the cold tries to go later down the road. We shall wait and see what happens. Of course, I've got an article uh, talking also about the um, about the, the, the recent wet uh, spells that we've seen, of course, as well on the website uh, el nino like i said going to be critical uh, we are seeing a decrease as you can see here in the nino region 1.2 which is closest to south america you can see this drop see a slight uptick in the anomaly here towards the very end of the period here we did have a pretty strong um uh, uh, westerly wind burst going across the pacific back um a few weeks ago here is that the a kelvin wave response perhaps Nino region 3.4 which is the central pacific that is going to be the barometer in terms of whether we have a madoki or a east based el nino so if you get the convection extending all the way to the south american coast uh, you would typically find that we have more of an uh, an extended and stronger jet stream not only across the pacific and across north america but also in turn across the north atlantic and that would probably drive a more December 2015 or 1997 type of, uh, of pattern where you've got a stronger polar vortex, stronger polar jet stream, and in turn a milder winter overall. So it's going to be important uh, to see where we go. So this is just building the overall picture to therefore make a, a call on what winter we are actually going to see here. So the positive Indian Ocean dipole, like I said, has been linked to that uh, powerhouse polar vortex back in the winter of 2019-2020. Uh, but we didn't have uh, an El Nino along with the positive IOD back in 2019. And with a negative QBO, quasi bedial oscillation, that is, of course, winds blowing from east to west within the stratosphere over the equator, that then 
can then correlate to a more negative Arctic oscillation and North Atlantic oscillation. So you've got a lot of competing factors this year. You can't, you know, look at one aspect at your peril, folks. And, you know, uh, based on what I'm wanting to see here, I'm, I'm wanting to call for a colder winter based on that. But it's not as simple as that, um, you know, and even one, two, three things could look excellent when it comes to either a warm winter or a cold winter, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly what's going to happen. So the, the last time that we had a positive IOD, like I said, was the strong episode of 2019. It was record strong positive IOD, but this didn't coincide with El Nino. Past years with both positive IOD and El Nino was 63, 72, 82, 97, 2015. So 97 and 2015, those were the two last super uh, El Nino years. And then, of course, 2018. You can see this graphic linking what type of Enzo versus the positive IOD we have seen. And our good friend Richard Trott, um, you know, says in this tweet here that the Easterly QBO is gaining strength, gaining momentum, and it looks very similar to October 2017, which is quite interesting. We've also had a, a healthy gain in Northern Hemispheric snow cover. Um, solar cycle 25, Northern Hemisphere snow cover gaining, uh, you know, gaining growth, of course, helps build the cold across the top. Uh, it's all very well, uh, you know, you don't want a, a, a super strong cooler vortex, but at the same time, you want to have plenty of cold to tap, and I think that's going to be the case. Solar Cycle 25, I kind of glaze over this a wee bit. I do apologise, I'm not giving an awful lot of time, but uh, it looks as if we have got a, a bit of a quietening down of the solar cycle. We did have, back earlier in the year, uh, a potential uh, peak, first peak of possibly two peaks in the solar cycle, of 25 here and it looks as if we may see that peak come a little bit earlier than the average time frame of course the average is about what 11 11 and a half years uh, for uh, the completion of a solar cycle sometimes it actually can be um, a little bit quicker than that it can be actually 9.9 .9 years according to our good friend uh, Richard Trott here I hope I'm right in saying that Richard I hope that information is correct it looks as if we've got a slightly stronger uh, solar cycle in the kind of low to moderate uh, range it looks as if it's slightly stronger than 24 but it's weaker than solar cycle 23 and uh, Richard goes on to say that it's very similar to the cycle of, uh, of 16 so cycle 16 is very comparable this is also according to Richard and Gavin we uh, Gav's weather vids this is a, um, a very comparable year to 2012. Potential sun stress for outwarming. So the ECMWF, interesting stuff. You can see here that it powers up. It goes beyond the average line. So we've got stronger winds blowing around the stratospheric polar vortex. The stronger the winds, the stronger the polar vortex. The weaker the winds, the weaker the vortex is. You can see here quite a lot of members indicating that we go uh, from a stronger than average to a, a below average strength polar vortex which is quite interesting here and some of those uh, winds actually reverse to an easterly in early December that is going to be the key thing so I have to say that recent runs have slightly slightly backed off the strong anomalous warmth in my opinion here this was before this is what's after and also the time frame of this potential strap warming is getting slightly pushed back so any if this remotely happens it is likely to be after the new year so i want to emphasize that point looks as if i've kind of run out of time unfortunately here be sure to check out the article here it, it also talks about wet octobers uh, versus past years and also an interesting one this is uh, the kamach ka i think that's the pronunciation uh, eruption uh, in far east russia now we've seen that in early uh, summer and I did attribute that slightly to the potential of increased blocking. We did see a very blocky summer and it's also going off at the moment. Could that be a wild card to enhancing potential high latitude blocking this year? My initial hunch, folks, for this upcoming winter is that it could be a predominantly milder winter but with spells of cold in between. That is where I'm going at this moment in time. Stay tuned. 
Thanks for watching. There will be a global weather report tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest.